Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sora, founder and CEO of Libraid Good MD, and welcome to Good MD Connect Live Series. Today, we are going to have a live session with Dr. Naresh Trehan, the top cardiovascular and cardiothoracic surgeon in India. Dr. Naresh Trehan is the chairman and managing director and chief cardiac surgeon of Medanta, the Medicity, a 1500 bedded multi speciality institute which offers cutting edge technology and state of art treatment facilities at an affordable cost. Dr. Trehan also founded the Escorts Heart Institute and Research Center, where he was the executive director. Escorts was conceptualized, created, and managed by Dr. Trehan from November 1987 to May 2007. As you would already know, Dr. Nair Trehan has also received many prestigious awards, including the Padma Shri and the Padma Bhushan Award presented by the Government of India. Without further ado, welcome, Dr. Trehan. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure to have Dr. Trehan with us. Today, when the world is grappling with the deadly coronavirus, doctors are at the biggest risk of contracting this virus. So today, we'll be discussing some of the most important queries of yours with Dr. Trehan and help you stay safe while helping India emerge victorious against this virus. So, Dr. Trehan, I would like to start with, you know, with a very basic question that, you know, many doctors have is, what are the symptoms that, you know, they should look for in a patient when they are seeing patients in their OPDs? So now we are in a triple jeopardy. One is that as we as we have all heard that more and more patients are actually contacting the disease but not showing any symptoms. So so we have sad, silent carriers and so far the estimate around the world is that maybe up to 80 percent of the people who get infected will either show no symptoms or very mild symptoms like a common cough and cold. So you need to divide up these people. One, how do we actually protect ourselves and protect those who have got infected but are not showing any symptoms? So one, of course, you may discover it by contact tracing that you have uh, been exposed and somebody uh, by mandatory by law or you yourself go and get yourself tested because you were in contact with somebody who got it. That's one way of finding out. The other way of finding out is that you do have the mild symptoms and you happen to go to a physician and a physician examines you and sees that yes, your symptoms are out of proportion to a common cough and cold. Like people say they have severe throat uh, irritation or pain. They don't show so much cough, cough and cold, but they show more signs of this or their lungs look congested, which they are not aware of on listening to their the lungs you find out. So then if you suspect, then you go ahead and, and get it done. And I think the index of suspicion should be low because if you have access to getting checked out by tested by a PCR, that's the one way, way to go. So if then it is obvious that somebody has got the fever, the triad of fever, cough, cold, and like I said, the throat is, is, is an important part of it or you're seeing congestion in the lungs, then most definitely they should be checked out now. So how do you protect yourself from these three situations? So universally today, you should not see a patient where the patient is not wearing a three layer mask or where you are not wearing a three layer mask. They should be screened outside your office. I mean, by whoever staff who is actually also masked history taken and try to can maintain the distance in your office. So like I do, I make them sit in a, on a sofa, which is about six, eight feet away from me. And I, I deal with them from there and they've already been examined uh, for any other ECG or echo and all that that has been done. So I can read all the reports and I, where, where need to, I need to listen to their chest, I do. But the basic thing is to make sure they don't have a cough and cold. Okay. Then the point is that you have already sanitized them as they, as you, their hands are sanitized. They have the tie. I mean, uh, the mask should be fitting well, and then they can be brought in and you see them. Now, the first sign of suspicion, you should get them tested and make it and also ask them to go to get tested right away so that you don't have too long a contact with that. So well, what, what it means right now. The estimation is, and there are no 100% proofs to this, that if you are exposed to somebody who has contracted the infection 
and you are within three feet of them for 15 minute contact and you're not wearing a mask, then the possibility is that you are at a high risk of having contacted the infection. Second, if they are wearing a mask and you're not wearing a mask and you're more than three feet away, your chances of contacting become low medium. If both of you are wearing a mask and you are more than three feet away, then the chances become minimal, minimal, minimal. And also the magic number they say is that prolonged contact. So means your your contact for 15 minutes, or maybe even if 10 minutes, you can you can contract it. So these are the things that you need to know about yourself and your patient to try to say uh, stay as safe as possible. This is the office practice. Now we, in our OPDs also at Medanta and all other OPDs, we are practicing this very uh, uh, sort of precaution. The other same thing you do outside your office is do not give appointments one after the other, one after the other. Give a gap of whatever you, time you usually take to supposing you take 20 minutes to, to see a patient. Then you should give at least half an hour difference and don't let them come into your clinic before their prescribed time. And, and so you rotate the patient so there is no crowding inside and that you are not overloaded with the burden of too many patients coming in with a viral load. So these are the things you can do for yourself. When you go to the hospital and you are going to see patients who may be suspicious or proven, then you need to get your PPP on. And that means that if they are proven, you need an N95 mask for sure and your full protection, Your because there are many models, but you know, as long as they are approved as safe, it's good to do that. The other thing that uh, that you you need to know is if you are actually taking care of them on a regular basis, then there is some uh, sort of our feeling is today that hydroxychloroquine, for as a uh, preventive, you may call it, or decreasing the viral load in case, because you are exposed to it. So people who are taking care of COVID patients on a regular basis in a hospital should be on hydroxychloroquine or people who have somebody with with COVID infection in their house and they are taking care of them, they're in house quarantine, then you should be taking, the person who's taking care of them closely should take it. So these are the kind of things that are current today. Now, there, I'm told that there are many Ayush doctors also on the line. So there are research that we are doing with the immune boosters we are giving it to our patients there is a 30 patient study going on right now by the icmr approved study that we are doing and then just we received a concoction from from uh, sri sri ravi shankar's outfit and they have supplied us some medicines because we have an open mind that look there are remedies out there that can help the body to fight infections and it may be COVID infection also, we don't know. But this randomized trial that we are doing will give us some idea of what are the adjuvant things. So I hope that answers your question on how to protect yourself. Yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, that, that you know, definitely does. There is one, you know, specific question on that is, you know, on the protective equipment. Uh, is it safe to use it? What is it since, you know, not many doctors have uh, you know all the availability of these equipments like at what level they should discard it so first there are two types ones that need there are one time use which should be only used once and there are multiple use by five six times there are being manufactured that you can sanitize with hypochloride solution mm -hmm. you can put them in a tank you can do many things we first personally unless it's a necessity you should not use it now because uh, redo it because you don't know whether you are effectively decontaminating them or not. Now you're talking about these these outfits are for people who are taking care of COVID patients, not for your home, yes. not for your own clinic. Okay, so that's why I'm saying that what what should you do to protect your family? Okay, the moment you get home from an active clinic, you discard your clothes send them for a wash, take a shower, change, and then go to the family. This is the best you can do to protect your family. If you develop a cough or cold, you know, in early stage, you feel the raspiness, 
start wearing a mask at home also. So these are the things you can do. But I personally feel the hospitals are equipped to use multiple use uh, PPEs, not individuals, because it's to do it at home will be very tough. Now, so if you are in the hospital, it's the responsibility of the hospital to provide you the appropriate PPE. Got it. Got it. Uh, sir, one more, you know, on, on that part, uh, is it, it's a very, you know, common question. Maybe the answer is sort of known to many doctors, but some of them have asked is, can I treat the COVID patient at my own clinic? No, you should not. Your job is to diagnose them and you follow the protocol. The pro protocol will be one, you refer them to a COVID hospital. Reported to the government that either you have you have found somebody who is tested positive, you must report it. Otherwise, it is it, it carries a, a penalty of even even imprisonment. So, so it's very it's your responsibility to to actually first reassure the patient that nothing bad is going to happen to them by reporting because there is a little stigma to it. But it is for their own protection. Second, there are protocols being developed right now. We, in fact, from Ajanta, we have also recommended, but it's not fully functional yet, is how to isolate yourself at home even when you're positive. How to quarantine, the, all, the whole gamut of how to do it. So that is in today's environment when the number of cases are not that large in concentrated areas, that there is no, there's no need for home quarantine right now because there are quarantine facilities available with the government and you can and they have made arrangements that if you don't want to go to a general facility and you want to go to a private there are hotels that have been converted into quarantine facility that can be done or you get an if, if you're if you've got symptoms you might as well get admitted to the hospital because then if your respiratory status gets uh, gets suddenly turns bad then you will not be able to come by the time you come to the hospital it would have made you feel worse so i think that that from that point of view although there is a there is that fear in patients that they to go to a facility and get admitted and all that they would like to avoid it but i think that let the rules play the role not you play the role got it i think that's uh that's a very you know a good uh, insight as to let the rules play the the game but uh, also, sir, you you really you know you mentioned uh, a while ago that how to you know use disinfect. If you can get a little bit in detail as to so let's say I'm a doctor, I am doing my OPD. How do I you know ensure that once the OPD is over, how do I disinfect my clinic? Is are there any protocols around that? So so you know the basic thing is that there is a documented evidence that COVID can live on surfaces. So what are the surfaces that anybody touches or you touch? Basically, you're touching your desk, your or your uh, way you use your instruments or anything like that, your stethoscope, all these things that are, that are the ones that are exposed. So if you had a patient who is positive, mm -hmm. then you have a different protocol. If he was not positive and you just finished your clinic, just wiping all the surface with either al alcohol greater than 70% alcohol solution or hypochlorite solution, which is Clorox basically, you, which is available, that you dilute it and you wipe all the surfaces. So there are two ways of doing it. One before you start, depending on the length of your clinic, you could take a break and do a second sweep of the surfaces that you're touching all the time. And then after you finish, of course, it should be done. So that's the best way. It's, it's a cheap way of doing it. It's not very expensive, but effective way of doing it. Now, if you have a patient in there who you thought spend a lot of time and you want, then there are hypochlorite sprays available, which you must spray all over the place just to be, if, if that's the case, that somebody who was COVID positive, supposing it's one of your staff, you'll have to, re, you have to close down for 24, 48 hours, spray it properly and then reopen. Got it, got it. So I think that's a that's a very good uh, you know way. But uh, and and we talked earlier, sir, about you know how to you know keep uh, yourself and you know your family also safe. We talked about that. 
you know people say that their kids don't get you know that uh, infection easily they don't get uh, the infection easily is it okay for me to sort of you know as a father i am a doctor but i am a father as well to you know come back home and you know hug my kids or is it i should be taking precaution myself as well not before you have taken a shower and change your clothes got it got it yeah i think you know this bravado on misinformation we don't know you know we are talking about pets and we everybody is swearing you can't you you can't get it from pets your pets won't get it now today if the report is right cnn was reporting two cats in new york have turned positive so i don't know this is a very wild virus and all bets are off so the more careful you are i see there are two different things people usually very frequently use the word panic mm mm-hmm. Panic is a terrible word. Panic means that you have lost your balance. That all of the whole society has lost its balance, running helter skelter, not knowing what to do. That's not the state. It is to be taken seriously, and seriously means you do what you can. You have the guidelines available. You know hand hygiene, masking, distancing. You want to do all those things for everybody's sake, not only your own sake. for your family's sake for your community's sake for your patient's sake for everybody as a national sake that you do not want to violate certain basic principles and that is stupid to do it but people are doing it now what do you do about that that this is so you can everything that we do in the next 3 to 6 months will have its perspective we should all practice it and then we can emerge successful against this terrible uh, pandemic so it's an invisible enemy so you don't have to be so paranoid that you're frozen but you you know there's no bravado in here there's no reason to expose your kids to you're coming home from your clinic and then you're in your hospital and then you expose them i i think that's a terrible idea not only your kids your own family your your wife or your, your parents especially your parents who are older so everybody can get it there are no rules there was initially they said only the older people are dying now 40% of the deaths are below 60 years of age in in, in fact mid life so don't depend on that any data will tell you it's okay yes you try to be careful there is no how much viral load is needed for a, to overcome a human being that depends on your immunity if you are if your immunity is good you are exercising you are healthy you are devoid of any Uh, uh any comorbidities your chances of getting at less and if you get it your chances of getting a milder form are much better so that's the calibration but having said all that i'm not sure even we know or as much as we know that there are no, no surprises in there got it uh since we you know talked about hydroxychloroquine you know earlier some of our you know doctors want to know what would be the you know the dosage the recommended dosage that you would recommend so first of all who are we recommending that's clear to everybody 400 mg twice for the first day morning evening and then 400 mg every week got it perfect uh sir one more thing one doctor you know r kumar has you know just now asked he says 69% are a symptomatic carriers so should one take the risk of seeing any case in eye clinic particularly if you wear a mask and that's what that's what i was saying if you are an ent doctor if you are uh, ent means ear nose throat you have eye doctor where you are exposed to mucous membranes and where you can you come in t- touch with fluid from the pa- from the patients always wear your gloves and wear an n95 mask now i want to tell you about n95 mask n95 mask because it's expensive and it's not readily available you can reuse it you can reuse it there are protocols for protocols of how to reuse it you can put it if you if you are an individual you, there is a plastic bag we have 100% alcohol in it dip it for 10 minutes or you can make it 20 let it dry and you're okay there are so the three layer masks if you're not seeing covid patients your three layer mask as we said if it's a regular surgical mask you can discard it and do it carefully in a in a isolated bin second if you are using a cloth mask which is also effective 
three layer cloth mask is also effective you get it washed every day first it should be put in a soap solution for a, for 45 minutes or an hour and then let it be and then dry it in the sun if there is sun so there are many many ways and all this is available even on the net that there is enough evidence there but the point is to protect yourself especially when you think that you are you are being exposed to fluid like in anesthetics when they are intubating somebody there is aerosol spray so those are the guys who need full protection what is uh sir one more thing as you know uh, doctors are seeing more patients uh as they see more patients and as they are you know locked down in their own clinics and they are also kind of travel they're also feeling and you know getting the sense of they're getting overwhelmed so as a doctor i'm also a human being how do i you know ensure that i take care of myself as well so you know de-stressing is a very important part of life as it is but at this time it is much more mm-hmm. so each one has their own devices whatever you're fond of uh, like i'm of i'm fond of sufi music okay so i'm dying to listen to it but i don't get the time because of the fact that there is so much happening so many uh, situations because we are we are uh, making a adopting a hospital to make it a covid hospital in gurugram you know, we are doing there's so many things you are involved with that it, it takes up full time but then it keeps you busy also so i don't get time to think but i i my craving personal craving is can i get to my boss uh, frame glasses and listen to some sufi music in little plug but what i find which is very entertaining is playing with the kids grandchildren uh, we have grandchildren and there are a lot of people who have children so playing with your children even games remotely they may be away from you even like our grandchildren are away but we play ludo we play guessing games antakshari all this stuff goes on so it keeps you gives you a break and and also makes you realize that you are closer to your family today than you ever were especially doctors because we are totally consumed even at home we are always on the phone some patient or the other needs you this is the time where if you if you get a break enjoy yourself i think we will we'll get busy again no question i mean there's one profession i mean people are wondering what's going to happen post covid post covid we will be swamped because we have postponed so many things in this lockdown period people are not are, uh, what is the downside of lockdown is that patients think that this is elective and then it becomes emergent while waiting but that's we have seen so many conditions especially in my field of heart surgery the patients who have actually died thinking that you know they'll wait till their lockdown right because they are petrified so if you get a heart attack at home there's nothing you can do because you are far away from a good hospital so there are downsides to it but overall we'll be very busy as as time goes by but right now the hospitals and and doctors are going through a big big uh, a sort of deficit uh, especially hospitals where you have fixed costs the occupancy is 20% 15% and the, the revenues are down to 15 20% but the fixed costs are very high in operating a hospital so so there are a lot of hardships but we'll come out ahead and uh, chin up we are the army we have to fight this is our moment got it uh, sir couple of other questions that have come up live right now uh, this is from uh, dr abita shadri she says you know what do you advise about uh, dentists because they say they we work predominantly in environment of aerosols as of now only emergency extractions are advised but how soon do you see dental work being allowed well you know you remember the time of of hiv hmm. that it created huge havoc in all our lives and then we learned how to cope with it so if you take the proper precautions you will treat them do not encourage people to come for cosmetic work or you know that kind of thing please don't if that can wait but for emergency procedures and for dentists and people who are working with aerosol even more important in addition to the mask and goggles they should wear a shield a shield is very effective to protect you from from aerosol aerosolization of you know your your uh, other uh, parts of in the sense if you wear goggles or mask then those aerosol things can come on you that with the shield it actually protects it and the shield can be easily cleaned cleaned and reused so it's not it's not such a big deal 
So be careful. That's what I'm saying. You should have goggles. You should have shield. If you're going to work inside the mouth, like I also said about anesthesiologist, also, also ophthalmologist. So whatever protection you can do is actually, I would say, overprotect yourself. Not a problem, but do it. Got it. Uh, very nice to hear, sir. Uh, another question, this is coming from Dr. Gulchan Arora. Uh, he asked, uh, sir, is there any possibility of developing herd immunity? And if yes, you know how long it may take? It takes a long time. Herd immunity is a one methodology when it happens. It is very desirable, but it takes a long time. Over 60% of the population will have to get infected to get herd immunity. Now, out of those, if you take India, uh, its population, 60% of those, if they get infected, even if 10, 15% of them require critical care or hospitalization, there's no, not enough bed in the world to be able to admit 15% of India's population. So you need to be, this route that we have taken is a very good route. The good route is, one, with the lockdown, there has been a disruption, disruption in movement, disruption in interactions. So the chain is broken temporarily. It doesn't mean that it's, it's permanent, but it has delayed the peak if it ever comes. So what in the meantime, in these four or five weeks, what has happened is, oh, four weeks already over, the fifth week we are running. And what, what has happened is that, yes, immunity is also developing in the, in, in the community in whatever small forms that they are getting exposed. So what happens in the hot spot? So in hot spot, you will see when they, over a period of time, they would have possibly been exposed. Everybody would have been exposed. And that's where they develop immunity, the antibodies to it. So in an artificial way, that is happening already in small, small pockets. So that helps anything, anything will help. It also breaks the chain and it has delayed the, the transmission, which is a good thing. Now, in the meantime, we have gotten ready with our medical services also. The enough number of beds, ventilators, PPEs, all that stuff is much, much better than it would have been if we did not lock down three weeks ago, four weeks ago. So that is one. Second, there is another help that India got that it has arrived relatively later in the chain. So it's traveled from China, Europe, the, you know, Southeast Asia, then America, and then it came to India or in any number. And unfortunately, it came from Italy and Iran, but it did. Now, what has happened is that we have three, four things that are in our favor. One is that maybe heat will help. Nobody knows, but in the past viral infections, there has been some relief in, in viral loads. Second, hydroxychloroquine. Now, if it is going to help the people who are taking care of and uh, care of COVID patients, maybe give some protection. Not clear, but there seems to be some benefit to it and also as a treatment to patients. Third is the fact that the lead drug, which is specific, these are repurposing of drugs that is happening, but remdesivir, which is a drug, which is everybody I think has heard about it, is now in advanced stages of phase three trial hoping that the trial will actually end in the next two, three weeks. They've also, the company Gilead that is manufacturing it has given substantial quantity to WHO to do a worldwide trial and India is the lead country in that. And uh, Medanta is also, has, has also applied that maybe we'll also get to do it, which is, which will tell us how effective it is in, per se against COVID and, and the one that we have in India, that is it the same uh, same response we'll get from our Indian patient. Third is the fact that are we having a blunted response because of the fact that we have immunity against so many diseases that we live in? And fourth is BCG. Now the question mark about BCG: a large part of our population is is immunized against uh, with BCG against tuberculosis, and that will that help us? So these are all unknowns, but I'm saying. Whoever it is and whoever is listening, whoever we speak to or, or even for myself, we need to get careful and not look at 
hopes that may come. If they come, fantastic. The best thing that would happen, that the it, it's not a real big peak, it's a blunted response, whether flattening of the curve as they call it. If that happens in India, we'll be able to handle it much better. If if it is a milder form, that would be a great blessing. If we have enough medication by the time people get sick in large numbers, that will be a blessing. So I think there are many hopes, but let's not pin our hopes on hopes. Let's be ready for the worst. And if it doesn't happen, then we can celebrate. Hopefully Diwali will be a big celebration. Got it. I think that's a, that's a very you know uh, nice way of you know cheering all the doctors. Sir, one uh, other question that has come up is, you know, is plasma therapy has recently been utilized as a treatment option. Is is that something that, uh, can you shed some light on that? Yeah, so, you know, we there are two things. One is plasma means that you take it from a patient who has already suffered the infection and has developed enough antibodies, IgG, enough IgG antibodies. You take that serum and you in, in, uh, inject it into a patient who is suffering hugely Hopefully, that the, the additional antibodies will be able to overcome the viral load. Okay. One thing, limitation is that it's not been used enough. And when is the right time to use it? Because this is now on compassionate ground you use it. Compassionate ground means that the guy, the person is gone and you're trying to save him then. So you never really find out the efficacy of, of that that intervention that you do, if it, if you do it too late. So now there is enough evidence that there is, it is quasi safe to do it. Maybe we can move up the chain a little bit to say, you know, they don't have to be like collapsing before we give it, but maybe if they're getting sicker, they need a ventilator or pre ventilator. If we give it, maybe we'll have a better response. There is scientific reasoning to it. So there is a sound basis for doing it because if they don't create any any reaction in the body like you know uh, a, a blood transfusion or anything might do that can hurt but otherwise if that is not the case we are okay with that so i think that is one promise that is in the and more and more people are recovering so we it will become more and more available and the other thing is stem cell which the israelis are talking about that they have taken mesenchymal cells or whatever cells they're talking about and actually used it in patients effectively. Now, if that's the case also, then those can be replicated very quickly around the world. It's remdesivir, plasma and stem cells. These are the three horizons that we are looking at closely. Got it, got it. Sir, another thing, uh, there are a lot of rumors around whether this can be spread through water sources also, and second on airborne, which is to say that through air conditioning as well. So, you know, it comes back to why the inf viral infections or bacterial infections uh, is not unknown through AC systems. If you are young, but when I was in the US, there was a epidemic of, or not epidemic, contained epidemic of Legionnaire's disease. Legionnaire's disease was named Legionnaire's because it started at a veterans convention, you know, veterans, American war veterans. And they were all like a, like a Legion, uh, you know, a conference or something. And in that it spread in Philadelphia and affected and killed many people. So that is how the origin of Legionnaire and people wondered where it came from, came from, came Finally, the consensus is that it came from the air conditioning. So somebody had it and then it spread. Now, that is a concern. But whether that has done damage to everybody or not, there are two, three incidents around the world where which make you suspect that that air conditioning was responsible. But it has not spread like to everybody so in the sense that if it was air conditioning it would spread much more rapidly so there are contradicting evidences to it so i don't know because it is always any disease that happens has to have a a load whether it's bacterial or viral that you get enough dosage and then the host resistance 
So it is always that balance that you find which will overcome your body or not overcome your body. So is there enough little, little bacteria coming down or viruses coming down from the air conditioning? Very, very possible. And I'm, I may say I'm sure they are. But are they enough to overwhelm you? There is no evidence to that. Same comes from air bomb. Uh, sir, how you know how long we can hope for a vaccine to be made available? Is it something that is going to come in this year? Well, if you look at the Oxford group, which has done uh, started early, they are saying that they have started human phase one trials. Phase one trials means that they are injecting asymptomatic or clean people and testing what dose and whether it's safe. So that's the phase one is safety trial. If that turns out they go to phase two and three, they may even compress phase two and go straight to phase three. So it will, at best, they are saying maybe we'll make it available by end of June and to the world by July, August. Very possible. And we are hoping, nobody wants to deny. We all hope that this is correct news. The rest of the world, there are, you know, though the Moderna and and uh, Johnson and Johnson in the U.S. have two lead vaccines, which have been funded by the U.S. government with by with four hundred million dollars or something. They are also moving, but they think that it won't be ready for six months, and then by the time it comes to the market, it will be eight to twelve months. So hopefully, this this the British group, which is working, will have success, early success. Now there are other labs also around the world that are happening. The Chinese are claiming that they are close to it or they have it or. But, you know, any news coming out of China has to be taken with a bucket of salt. Uh, so I think it's better to hold our horses. But there is hope. And I'm saying that India is, is, is a late comer in this whole tragedy, which is a good thing. So maybe we will benefit more than other companies, uh, other countries have because it has devastated so many countries. Anything that can bring Europe and America to its knees means huge, huge impact. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, sir, another question which has come just now from Dr. Saurav Mukherjee. Uh, he's asking, you know, how can we get rid of, uh, you know, you talked about how to get rid yourself about from the, by taking a shower and, you know, just after seeing patients. But what about currency? Like, what about the currency notes? Uh, the Indian rupee? How do we get rid of that? We want that. After a while, and I should not be the doctor to be saying all this. Yeah. Where does it stop? The basic thing is, did you touch a package by just touching it one minute and between two fingers? Is it is it overwhelming you? I doubt very much. I, there is no evidence that it comes from notes, newspapers, home delivery. These are all we don't know. And we are saying, you know, there's a pizza delivery is bad. You know, if you take precautions, it's not. So the people who are preparing it, are sanitizing everything, they sanitize their hands, wear gloves, wear double mask before they come to your door, and you wear a mask before you receive anything, and you have no contact, you're not hugging somebody who's giving you and delivering you a pizza or any any home delivery. I don't think that that and so you can take the package, discard the, the envelope immediately, and wipe out the so you can take precautions like alcohol, sponges, and all that you can do. And but nobody has really said that look this is the quantum that is residing on a newspaper and you touch a newspaper and you touch your nose or your mouth and you're going to be infected so but like i said doesn't matter you are on the cautious side of things so do as much as you can and uh, then it may be that everybody will get some form of it we don't know the way it's going it will keep going it may come back like it has come back in some countries so either herd immunity will take place or vaccine will come to our rescue and 90% of the people or more will, will get mild infection or a little bit of infection and then get better and maybe 2-3% will lose. But otherwise we are hoping that there may be, India may have better statistics than the rest of the world because we are late comers in this. Got it. Uh Sir, you know, on that note, there is another question that has come up. Uh, there has been research on developing immunity once you have contracted the virus. 
there are antibody tests that has come up or is going to come up and there have been contradictory reports especially coming from china and other places that uh, people are contracting the disease again after having been treated there is reports from korea also japan also yes yeah. so we don't know see when hap- when it happens to a small number of people we don't know what their circumstances were Mm-hmm. we have seen in patients even while they are in the hospital they turn negative and then they positive, turn positive again yeah so one what is the what is the quantum of antibodies that say igg which stays in your body for long periods of time how what is your how much igg did you uh, antibodies did you develop in your blood if you had enough load and which would fight any little little viruses flying around and then neutralize them it's okay but there maybe there are some people who didn't who didn't develop enough of a immunity and then they got resurgence so these things can happen but is it a rule we'll only find out with time and the fact that we need to do enough studies to see that when somebody has recovered do they have igg uh, antibodies in them and what what happened whether they got exposed again or what happened we don't know and what is their background so i don't think enough has happened they japan has had to lock down again i mean declare emergency in some areas south korea has had to do that so i think i don't think you can close your eyes to it and think that like some of the other like measles and all that if you get you rarely will get measles again once you've got it but is it the same immunity in this virus all bets are off because it's a crazy situation nobody knows what the hell this is the only thing that we know it's a very resilient virus and that it spreads like crazy that we know got it sir one last question i know you are you know you are in a hurry and you have to leave now in another 5 minutes so i was just wondering one last question this this you know uh, you know in india and immunity is playing a great role you know as we discussed earlier as well and you mentioned Uh, so dr geeta rora is you know asking us what is your opinion on you know ayurveda and homeopathic uh, you know medicines helping to raise immunity in particular and whether you think an overall approach of integrative approach uh, is something that should be applied here most definitely i am the flag bearer of the belief that traditional medicine has huge huge uh, strength in it which unfortunately has never been standardized properly so that the world can accept it and in addition to that there has been this whole heavy metal used in ayurveda which is a dicey business because if you want to use heavy metals you know in the in the ancient times they used to bury the stuff with like mercury into the ground at 400 degrees centigrade or something like that and it would become a morphous it would not be a metal anymore but for production i mean people have done all sorts of stupid things and got a bad name to lead and mercury and all that stuff so i think ayurveda formulations that means herbal of formulations devoid of metal are safe they have a role to play because they kept the world going in india it kept going for thousands of years and so did traditional chinese medicine so if you look at it i'm sure there are many many remedies in there and like i said we are testing some to see that you be, the, what is the principle modern medicine works from outside in they say you got a problem let me give you something which is mostly a poison whether antibiotics or a chemotherapy or surgery or radiation these are the three things that we know really we, it is effective very invasive very expensive we do, we ignore the body completely whereas all traditional medicines only strengthen the body to fight the disease because they don't have radiation they don't have many surgical procedures so thank god for that so if we can use the immune boosters or uh, from from traditional medicine and whatever we can use from the outside from modern medicine that powerful the combination would be hugely powerful like an army and air force but there is lot of research required there is very little documentation there are good people working on it uh, in you know uh, i was on a call, call yesterday with, with dr darshan from from bangalore who has got this hospital he's made and and he's doing some research mm-hmm. we want to collaborate with him 
He has grown, he has done the pharmacopoeia on 5,000 herbs. So a lot of work is there, but it's not become to a complete ecosystem yet. And I think we should, if we want to, really we should bring it into into like a front stage very quickly. And there is there are lots of good things in there. So I'm one of those. One of those guys who are at odds with the rest of, um, mostly most of my colleagues, but I'm a believer, as you may have felt. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trehan, for, for spending time with us and, you know, enlightening doctors, you know, around India on how to manage in this difficult time. And we really appreciate uh, you having us with us today. So right, right now, we don't say bye. We just say stay safe. Yes. Uh, stay safe and uh, Jai Hind. Okay. Bye. All the best. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, जी, अब क्या छुट्टी है दो मिनट